I'd like to begin a series of talks on the Yoga Sutra that I've already begun. I'd like to begin a series of talks on the actual practice of yoga. And in that, the two most important books are the Patanjali Yoga Sutras and the Vigyana Vairava Tantra. I won't get into the Vigyana Vairava Tantra now, but it's for a little advanced people. The Yoga Sutras also are for advanced people, but even learners can profit. Now, one of the most important things in yoga is what is known as the Ashtanga or the Eight Limbs. And we will talk on the first limb or what is the first classification. It is called Yama or Yam. Not Yama, the god of death, though even that is a mistake. Yama is not the god of death. Yama was the first enlightened man to die. So now he becomes the person who deals out karmic reward and retribution. Yama is not the god of death. That's a mistake. He was the first enlightened person to die. But the concept Yama or Yam, as they say, it fundamentally means restraint. It means literally, what does Yama mean? Literally, it means an enclosure. You create a fenced off space for yourself within which you do your process, within which you do your sadhana within which you do yoga. Why is that? Because yoga understands that evolution happens not step by step, not periodically, but in great leaps. Now this is well understood in evolutionary theory today, that there seems to be these fallow times where nothing is moving, nothing seems to be going step by step, one foot in front of the other. There seems to be these fallow times and then suddenly there is an explosion of new forms. Similarly in yoga, it is very well understood, it, Patanjali has described it as that your sadhana is the process where the water is building up, the water is building up behind the dam, behind the dam, behind the reservoir. Then when the rains come, the water overflows and floods the whole. Country. So each time you break through to a next level, it happens like that. It doesn't happen step by step. So what happens when we are in process, when we are in sadhana is that many times it seems like there is no movement, there is no growth, nothing is happening, but actually the Shakti is building up. The Shakti is building up, the Shakti is building up, it builds up, comes to that point and then it suffuses the whole organism. The mind, the body, everything, the emotions, the pranamya kosha, it suffuses that overflow of shakti, that overflow of energy, transforms at all levels. So it's a transcend and include. The next level includes the lower level, but it is always at a higher vibration than the lower level. So that whole process of transcend and include, transcend and include. So for that is the reason why we need yama. That is the reason why we need restraint. Now the word has been translated in multiple ways that is because these are sutras. Sutras, they will never explain it. They will use words with such shakti. They will use words with such shakti that you have to engage with it and you have to come to an understanding. So the word yama means restraint, it means discipline. I like the classification, I think David Frawley had said it. He said that Yama means all that I shall not do. Niyama means all that I shall do. You know, all my shall nots are classified in Yama. These are the things which I will not do. These are the things I will not engage in. These are the things I will not waste my mental space, my emotional space, my energy space and my physical space on. Whatever you consider to be a no-go area, this is what I will not engage with, that becomes your Yama. Why do we do it? Now please understand, there is a mistake, there is a common assumption in, even in yogic circles where actually it should not exist but there is a really tragic assumption that each anger, each limb is like a step in a ladder. 
you know, first yama, then yama, then finally we come to samadhi. No. They are always valid at all times. Yeah, it's like yama is your left leg, niyama is your right leg. Now you can go without using your left leg, but it's a little problematic and tricky. So no matter what the level you come to, no matter how much you aspire to, no matter how much you attain, the ashtanga remains valid all through. The ashtanga remains valid until the time you are carried by four people. Yes? Ashtanga, eight limbs. Now the word Anga also is being translated as limbs. But that's not actually... Okay, for want of a better word we can say it is a limb. It is a, actually it means faculty. It means a zone of possibility. It is something that you develop so that you can evolve. Now all yoga is so that you can evolve. So that you can consciously evolve. Unconsciously the evolution is happening. But yoga is the process by which we activate the Kundalini Shakti which is the force behind evolution and we consciously ride that tiger or dragon whatever it is you wish to call it. So, whether it is Yama or Niyama or whatever you talk about it, it doesn't mean that because you have come to a certain level in yoga, therefore no more Yama for me. Do I hear that? It is not steps in a ladder, it is a continuous ongoing process and very often uh, people who attain to certain levels they get derailed because they give up the their yama name. especially those who are told by their disciples oh aap to bhagwan hai aap to jeevan mukta hai then they think okay no more need for yama niyama for me and then the downward spiral begins. So, it's not necessary for enlightened people to meditate, but they know that the discipline is needed. If the discipline is not in place, then one day there is no height from which you cannot fall. So, if the discipline is not needed. Now, there is an aspect of personal yama where you have to decide for yourself, these are my parameters. These are my boundaries, these are the behaviors, these are the actions that I will not indulge in. And there are what are called samajik yamas. There are things that are applicable at all circumstances to everybody. So in the process of yoga, there are five aspects of samajik yama, you know, things that apply to everybody. The first is called satya. Satya means truth. Now, yoga is one of those frustrating things in which everything is simple and horrendously difficult, yes? Yeah? Don't mistake the complex for the difficult. The complex is only complex, it's not necessarily difficult. Usually the simple things are difficult. For instance, don't tell a lie. <laughs> That's complex. Yeah. No, that's not at all complex, it's exceedingly simple. Yeah, you are either truthful or you are not. It's exceedingly simple. Even small children get it. Even animals get it. If you go onto YouTube and you keep guilty dog videos, <laughs> you know, the dogs know very well when they have done something wrong and you know the, the kind of behavior that they manifest. So even they know. Even they know. Why does yoga make such a fuss about truthfulness? Because if you are dishonest, if you are not in integrity, it creates big boulders in your evolution. It creates big vignams in your energy. If you say something, if you make a commitment, I will be there at 3 o'clock and then you cancel at the last moment or you turn up at 3.40, to that extent you have reduced your shakti. Between your vak your speech and your pravati, your action, there should be absolutely 100% over you. There should not be any divergence. The more divergence there is, so it looks like nitpicking on the part of the great masters because they would always insist. Ramakrishna Paramahansa was very famous for this. 
he was told, somebody said, shall I come and meet you next Thursday? And he said, yes, please do. And the person said, oh, I forgot I have something to do on Thursday. Can I come on Wednesday? He said, no. You know, because I have committed to a certain thing. Whether you have committed or not, I don't know. But now Thursday is the only time. So, Satya in that sense is your commitment to integrity. Now, if you see somebody who is intent on murdering somebody and they ask you, have you seen that person, you are allowed to lie and say, no, I haven't seen. That is not a failure from Satya, you know, that is not a, uh, you are allowed to, yoga is not stupid, that is what is called as Vyavaharika. Uh, depending on the situation, you can change your, your, uh, so, you know, you are allowed, in certain exceptional circumstances, you are allowed to be a little flexible with the truth. But in general, in general, if you are, in general, if you are in the habit of white lies or even big fat lies, it will start impacting your practice. It will start impacting your evolution. It will start impacting your life. If you can not commit to something, don't commit. But once you commit, see it through. Again, this is an exceedingly, exceedingly simple thing to say. It is a fiendishly, horribly difficult thing to, to practice. If you just try and practice, and you say, okay, I'll do this at a particular time, or I'll meet this person, or I'll, just try and stick to your commitments, you'll see how difficult it is. So the first thing they tell you is that, don't commit unless you are sure you can see it through. So the aspect about not lying and all that, do you really need me to tell you why it is a bad thing to lie? And why when you are caught out in a lie, why when people find that you have no more credibility? Okay, if you are a politician, then lying is your second nature. <laughs> that is probably the swadharma of being a neta, I don't know. <laughs> but you know. The reason in yoga is very simple. If you are living a lie, telling a lie, if you are not in integrity, if you are not integral with your word, that is what they say, be integral with your word, be truthful to your word, it really impacts, it really, 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 really impacts your processes. It really impacts. And if you come to a certain level of growth in yoga, you can actually feel the difference. Once you tell a lie, you can feel the difference. Now, in the days when I got activated, I got a little gift with that activation because the Shakti used to pour in from the top of my head full time. And any time somebody in front of me would tell a lie, it would stop for one second. <laughs> so it became, I became like this universal lie detector. <laughs> and if I told a lie, that's it, half a day it would shut down. So I began to realize that it has to be, one has to be very, very careful in this matter. Because if you are in the habit of lying, in the end you end up deceiving yourself more than anybody else. Yes, Shakespeare in Hamlet had a very famous speech by Polonius to his son. And one of the things he said, the last thing he said in fact, this above all, to thine own self be true, for it follows then as surely the night the day thou canst not be false to any other man. You can lie and cheat other people, but you can lie and cheat yourself. Which is why they say you cannot deceive an honest person. You cannot play a confidence trick on an honest person. Shakespeare was one of the great masters of the world, but because he's an Englishman and he lived in Elizabethan times, we don't understand. But you will actually learn more about life from Shakespeare than anywhere else in the world. Shakespeare is probably the best training for living in integrity. Shakespeare is probably the best training for understanding life. That speech of Polonius, but this just staggered me when I first saw it, because I'm like, the man is a yogi. Because he understands that we can deceive others only if we are deceiving ourselves, we can cheat ourselves. The man is a yogi, he understood that. So thine own self be true. 
morning we were having a little debate about what is considered the soul. The word soul is such a bad translation for Atma. Most people confuse their personality for the soul. So, your personality is not the soul and the soul cannot be touched in any way. But that is for another time. Whenever I talk about Atma, you can get into that. So, the first, the first aspect, the first samajic aspect of Yama, of restraint, of the first limb of yoga, the first anga of yoga is satya. The next is ahimsa. Now ahimsa is usually very badly mistranslated as non-violence. That's because Gandhi was the most famous proponent of it. He never really learnt yoga or anything seriously. Most of his views were Jain views anyway. His biggest mentor was a Jain. So Gandhi's notions on Ahimsa were Jain notions. They were not actually Hindu notions. Now the non-violence as a rule is there only for those in sannyasa. Those who have taken sannyasa, those who have renounced, they are not allowed to even to defend themselves. If they are attacked, they have to take it as their karma or they have to take it as Rinanubha. But for people like us, if we are attacked, we are totally allowed to defend ourselves. This distinction was made very clear by Swami Vivekananda, by Aurobindo. In fact, one of life's great pleasure is reading Aurobindo laughing at Gandhi and his notions of Ahimsa. <laughs> but that's another. Any time you read, because he would. He understood that Gandhi didn't have a yogic perspective on the matter. But Ahimsa basically is a sense of not desiring to harm another person. Now you might think what is the big deal? After all we are all decent people, it is very easy. No, you would be very mistaken. There is a sadist in all of us. Why? Because pain is actually very effective. Yeah, a person goes insane, you cannot reason with that person, you cannot medicate that person, but if you beat that person, that person will modify their behavior. Even the most violent, insane person understands pain, understands physical pain. During the time that Stalin created the Gulag, in, you know, when he was born in Russia, they would take people to Siberia and then make them walk. Many people would get exhausted and they couldn't go on and they would threaten them with bayonets. They would poke them with bayonets. They threaten to shoot them and the people would be like, kill us. Then they discovered something very interesting. They discovered that if you beat that person with sticks, he will get up and walk for another two hours. Long after he has lost the fear of death, lost the fear of being bayoneted, if you just beat the person, he can still be made to move for another 2-3 hours, after which the body will completely collapse into coma, at which point they put you on the track. So pain can motivate a human being way beyond anything else, which is the danger of pain, which is why people like to beat, and which is why the same came up, spare the rod and spoil the child, yes, because children very easily can be trained, animals very easily can be trained with pain. That danger, that danger of enjoying inflicting pain, which can be activated in any human being by the way. Please do not think that that will never be possible for us. Stanford University created a very, very famous scientific experiment but people were told this is in the cause of pain and it was fake but they thought they were giving electrical shocks to somebody and the people would keep giving shocks long after that the actor pretending. You know, if you want you can go on YouTube and find that. It's very famous. So it's very easy to activate that sadistic side. So Ahimsa is that protection against sadism. Is that protection and pain, inflicting pain has a sexual erotic component to it. People get a lot of pleasure. They get a lot of pleasure in <laughs> inflicting pain on other people. Some people are even more damaged, they get a lot of pleasure from. So that is masochism. You know? But there is also sadism. And the sadists and the masochists find all the sadists inevitably end up in the police forces of the world. Yeah? It's, a, it's a common. 
all the sadists and psychopath type personalities end up in the police forces. Yeah. It's inevitable, and then the behavior, and then the behavior, the way, the way they are expected to behave, they also get corrupted. They also get corrupted. It's inevitable. So to protect you against that kind of corruption, to protect you against the temptation to inflict harm, because there is a very animal pleasure in it. Have you seen a cat play with a mouse? Anybody had a cat? I had. And it's one of the most extraordinary things you can see in your life. It's one of the most extraordinary things you can see in your life. And cats are very grateful animals, so whatever they hunt, they will come and drop it in front of you. <laughs> yeah, they keep trying to repay you for what you have done. So you can see that you can see that cats are extraordinary beings. One day I'll talk about animals in yoga. No? It's very interesting what a cat is, what a snake is. I have a about that. Later. Off-topic interruptions. <laughs> Off-topic interruptions. <laughs> so that is actually all that is there behind Ahimsa. Ahimsa, Parma, Dharma and all that. I'm afraid in most cases it is Ahimsa, Daro, Dharma. People are scared, people are weak and they claim to be non-violent. Not so. They don't have the strength to bash up the other books. <laughs> so they claim to be non-violent. One should not be in delusion. One should not be in delusion. Unfortunately, India, delusion and incompetence are very vital aspects of our national personality. So, don't be saying that I am non-violent when all you can say is that I don't have the strength or I don't have the authority to inflict that suffering on a person. But for yogis, Ahimsa was created so that the temptation to fall. And please understand, torturing yourself is also Ahimsa. Osho once made the very valid point. If I take a gun and hold it to your head and say, do as I say or I will kill you, that is violence. If I say, do as I say or I will starve myself to death, how come that is not violence? End of argument. Because in both cases, the threat of a death is being used to force a behavior on a person who is not willing. So the argument is over. So please understand, you are not supposed to torture yourself also. So all these extreme forms of starvation and sadhana and all that that people do, that is also himsa. Yogis do not appreciate those kind of torturous they do not appreciate all that. So all that stunt about lying on nails and all that is really not yogi practice. They don't like that. Even the Buddha understood that by torturing the body you can make your mind still, but you know that is not a healthy way to do. Which is why he gave up. He gave up that whole torturous methods of sadhana. That is also himself. He understood that. That too is violence. So, violence against yourself is actually a greater sin than violence against other people. I know that's not the moralistic point of view, but trust me, it is true. <laughs> yeah, first be kind to yourself. <laughs> then we have something called asthya, non steel Again, an interesting thing because it's not simple about going up to a person, showing a knife and snatching something. It's not simply about coming in with you know, the armed forces behind you or the police forces behind you and dispossessing an entire community because there is mineral wealth on their land and so they have to be forced off. That, those are all the very obvious and gross. But every time we eat even a grain of rice, we are stealing its life. We cannot live without causing a little bit of harm. Yeah? Life feeds on life. It's a very simple thing. So not to steal actually means not to take more than the bare minimum to survive. 
Now that is not the value of the world today. The world has become westernized and today the whole thing is increased consumption in every way. Yeah? The brighter, stronger, more powerful gadget in every way. You know? So all that is stealing. Where are we stealing from? We are stealing from the future generation. We have brought the planet to the brink of catastrophe and you know, nobody is willing to accept it. Let the sea levels rise. Maldives is anyways going underwater very soon. <laughs> Let the sea levels rise, let the level of the sea of Mumbai change, then probably we will start developing some sense about it. But all this comes because of not understanding. You cannot keep stealing. We are stealing from the earth. We are stealing oil. We are stealing natural resources. You cannot keep plundering in this manner. And the psychological kinds of thefts are much worse. Because everything has a price, pay the price. That is the first law of karma. Nothing is for free in the universe. Absolutely nothing. You have to always keep judging. Is that price worth it? Is that price worth it? And one of our biggest problems in the country today is this. We want the best things, the things that can transform you, the greatest spiritual things to be free. And that is the number one reason why we are poor. We do not understand that value must be exchanged. If you are receiving something transformatory, if you are receiving something spiritual, it must be paid for and it will be paid for. The minute this give it for free attitude began, we did not realize we had all become thieves in a sense. Now, we are a very lucky minority because we are sitting in a place like this, we had an English education, what is our responsibility to give back to society? We have to think about that. If we are not giving back, then in that sense we have failed in a step. So it's a very deep aspect of the Yama. It's a very, very deep. And I don't really like to talk much about it because if you start opening it up, people go into depression for a couple of days. So, because then you begin to realize we have lived by snatching. Huh? Relativity is a nice 20th century term for being guilt free, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah? Yeah. That thought is there in all yogic communities, even the Jains. Yeah. We are seeing. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we get cheap cotton clothes because Bangladeshis make them in terrible conditions. That karmic price has to be paid somewhere. The karmic price has to be paid somewhere. It doesn't disappear. It doesn't dissolve because it is uncomfortable for us to think about. So, asthya is that aspect of consciousness which we should. When I buy something like this which has toxic chemicals or it has... What are the benefits of having a machine like this? Yeah. If I can... If I can in some way convince myself that having and using a thing like that is in the end more beneficial to consciousness, that is the only reason. That is the only reason. Otherwise, it's basically a toxic byproduct. You know, and the way it is done, it is on the basis of exploitation of hundreds of people. So one needs to have that. The next one is called Aparigraha, which means not coveting. It means lack of greed. For yogis it is very simple, don't accept gifts. Why? Because nothing is for free. So even if you take something for free, there is a karmic price which you have to later on pay. When uh, Bhishma was lying on the bed of arrows, yes, in the Mahabharata at the end, he was asked by Yudhishthira, who was very traumatized by it, that how can a man like you, how can an enlightened man like you end up like this? How did you end up fighting on their side? And he said, I made the mistake of eating their food. Because I owed them that food and that stature and that dignity, that corrupted me. Because it was coming from a person 
of lower consciousness of vibration. It was coming from a corrupt person. My entire stature, my entire place in the world, even my food was dependent on people like that. I failed in a parigraha. Now this torture is so that I am purified. All that contaminated blood drip away from me. So that I am purified of that contamination. So again, not to covet, this goes completely against our current culture, yes? Because every advertising <laughs> TV spot is only to increase desire, you know, make you feel that I am lucky, you know, because I don't have this, I don't have that, you know, it's like, I saw this on the back of a truck and I was mean, like, the guy summed it up, you know, like, Dekkar Parari Amanat, Hairan Na Ho, Rab Tujko Bhi Dega Pareshan Na Ho. <laughs> Seeing what other people have, please don't get upset, God will give you also. <laughs> and I'm like, there, he has summed up our contemporary mindset. <laughs> he's a truck driver, but he has had it. He, he's got it. <laughs> so, how much is enough? Leo Tolstoy wrote this very famous short story, How Much Land Does a Man Need? And the short story was basically. One guy who just wanted to prove the insanity that people will do, he was a rich landowner and he calls up uh, people and says, from sundown, from sun up to sundown, the amount of land you can cover, that will be yours. So one guy starts and the whole story is about he's trying to get desirable land for himself. He covers, he gets the maximum amount of land, he kills himself, he gives himself a heart attack. And the story ends six feet by six feet, that was all the land that he needed because they gave him the grave. So, when we talk of a parigraha, what we are talking about is where do you set your level of satisfaction? What is enough? Now, nobody can answer that question for you. No, it's not at all difficult, it's very simple. It's difficult because we don't want to give up. It's like when you want to give up, you want this much for your life to be balanced, and when you reach that level, you aspire for more, then it keeps on increasing. So you were wrong in what you thought you wanted. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You were totally wrong in what you thought you wanted. You didn't recognize yourself. You didn't recognize that I will not be satisfied. The more important question is, is that a valid desire? Do you really require that? Difficult question. <laughs> It's because the consciousness is such, the entire zeitgeist, the entire spirit of the time is such that you are told unless you accumulate, you are a failure. Yes? And when you accumulate things, parts of your consciousness go to them. So the more things you multiply, you actually think you are also in logic. It's a very, very dangerous trick that your mind plays on you and it's a trick that everybody falls for. The day you start throwing away stuff, one of my friends called me up from the US and said, I have thrown out 160 clothes. I said, if you can give up 160 clothes without worrying about it, just imagine how much you accumulated junk. So this question of things, why do people, because you know, I had put up that post also, because when we achieve a goal or we achieve a target or we get something, there is that little flash of happiness and that is actually quite rare in the normal human life, <laughs> moments of happiness. <laughs> so we try to replicate it. My next achievement, my next, and yoga is saying you can be in ananda, not happiness. Happiness is ditch water compared to ananda. Things cannot bring you happiness. So of course, I heard this brilliant. Those who say that money cannot buy you happiness didn't know where to shop. You know, so, <laughs> so <laughs> I'm like, yeah. You know, but 
I was recently reading that they have created a $5,000 burger. Now, you know, this is just for people who have too much money and don't know what to do with it. How can a burger cost $5,000? What are they going to put into it? That is insanity and that is when guillotines are needed, you know, because people who do that, their head should be cut off, you know. They are people just taking up valuable oxygen and resources on the planet. A person who can think that, a person who can dream up that kind of idea and then the person who validates it by buying that, both of them are burdens on the earth. The burden should be lessened. However, but Aparigraha, they simply don't understand that. They simply don't understand that notion of not grabby. The greed. You know, children have it, no? Mine. Yeah? They won't look at the toy. Somebody from outside comes, wants to play with it. Suddenly, that is their favorite toy at that moment. <laughs> yeah? You see that? I disagree. I've seen my little one. He's now being conditioned to feel it's his. Hmm. Initially, in the last two and a half years, that time he never wanted to grab anything. See, I like, said don't interfere with children only. No? If they feel so, let it be so. Don't That's force them to be generous. That is the worst problem. Yeah. They are forced to be generous. Yes. They are forced to share. And you know, resentment builds up. Resentment builds up. You know? And so when they grow up, they are like mine. And it's a childish attitude. Because three and a half minutes without oxygen and everything, all your hopes, dreams, all. <laughs> yeah. Just three and a half minutes, that's all it requires for a life to be without meaning. And the last one is Brahmacharya. It's not the last, but I place it last because it is the most misunderstood. Now, brahmacharya is usually translated as celibacy, it's translated as no sex. I have never seen anywhere in yoga where they define it. It's no sex or celibacy. No sex. That no sex. When you are doing certain yogic processes, at that time if you are indulging in sexuality, it has very bad effects on your health. That is the time. Certain people, Swami Vivekananda, Isaac Newton, Nikola Tesla, they were celibate by nature. By nature, there are some people like that. And they become very phenomenally like genius levels. You know, Tesla was one of the greatest geniuses the world has ever seen. Nikola Tesla, just go on the net and find he was much, much greater than Edison. Swami Vivekananda, in fact, met him once. And all of Tesla's friends were encouraging him to get a girlfriend and everything and he was creeped out by the idea. So somebody had the sense to make him meet Vivekananda and Vivekananda said, this is one of the rarest gifts. And he asked him, you have photographic memory? Yes. You can project something. Nikolai Tesla wouldn't even design machines. He would hold it in his mind. He would run the machine in his mind and he could tell you what the condition of the machine would be five years later. All the wear and tear, he could see it. He could project it like a computer simulation into the future. Similarly with Vivekananda, people who are naturally celibate always have what is called the eidetic memory. They can recall everything to its last microscopic detail. Even I had it, then puberty kicked in and that was the end of the eidetic memory. But I did have it. I remember what it is like to have an eidetic memory. Because my class teachers when I was small would give me a book and the next day it was my job to recite the story to the class. And I would recite it word for word. Word for word. I mean, the teachers would call other teachers to come and see this. <laughs> okay. You're rather innocent, I must say. <laughs> Children are extremely sexual beings. <laughs> but that doesn't mean that they, they have hit puberty. You know? <laughs> so, 
those who are born, not those who are hypocrites and those who are frustrated and those who have gone to the art of living and they have been told to be celibate. <laughs> that is like the most nasty thing you can tell young people, you know. I mean, this, I saw this once on uh, in TV, that fellow who was there, Cyrus, he does that Bakra thing, he just basically smiled your own candy camera. So they tried to set up Rahul Dravid with some young girl who was pretending to be interested in him and greatly to Dravid's credit, I don't know, but he was completely horrified. He shot up like a rocket <laughs> from his seat. <laughs> but I found it so funny because what he was telling her was what his grandfather would have said, pay attention to your studies. <laughs> young person is having raging hormones in them, studies were not good. <laughs> so, there are ways to deal with that, there are methods in olden times they knew what happens when a young person comes, what breathing do they need to do so that this doesn't run out of control. Today we don't have that and we have this universal prescription, pay attention to your studies. <laughs> and so, we teach our children to be hypocrites, we teach them that if you have sexuality or any kind of, in any way a sexual being that leads to social disapproval, so they become hypocrites. And they serve pawn in their lives. You know, we, we create these, because we have, our culture is fragmented, I keep saying this. Yoga knew what to do when the hormonal change happens, yoga knew what to do. There are things to do when you do that so that it doesn't run out of control. But criminalizing sexuality is not brahmacharya, it is, I mean, the most catastrophic misinterpretation of brahmacharya and all these notions that, you know, you can transform the vital seminal fluid or whatever is the equivalent in the women and then that becomes rojas and... Are you kidding me? The kind of sadhana that is required to do for that is mind-boggling. Mind-bogglingly difficult sadhana you require to do that. But you know, people don't understand that and in a sense this whole Victorian attitude that we have, you know, where the Victorians had this whole notion that emission of seminal fluid leads to blindness, leads to brain decay and we just internalized it full scale. And then we had Gandhiji who was like a great Victorian <laughs> and he had this complete horrified fear of sexuality, basically because he was having sex with his wife and his father died. So, he never got over that trauma. He never got over that trauma. He was what, 16 years old or 15 years old and he never got over that trauma. So, for him sex was always, but that's not the yogic attitude. The yoga knows very well what brahmacharya means. It means sexual restraint, just like it is a yama, remember? It is your, this is what I will do, this is what I will not this is my zone of possibility. This is what is acceptable to me. This is what I consider right for myself. That is Brahmacharya. Someday I'll talk intensely on Brahmacharya because really somebody needs to speak up. The problem is Osho spoke up but he was so provocative in this matter that you know he was just dubbed a sex maniac and it was left up. But this foolishness about Brahmacharya has to stop. It is damaging our culture, it is damaging You know, Gandhiji went to the extent he was so traumatized by the notion newly married couples would come to him and he would make them promise that they would not have sex. <laughs> Jay Prakash Narayan was one of those people who was forced into celibacy. You know, Jay Prakash Narayan, leader of the whole anti Indra Gandhi movement in the 1977. Yeah. He was one of those. Population. Huh? No, he did it because uh, there are other and better ways to reduce population. Please don't say silly things. Please don't say sweet things. But Gandhiji, he had this fetish about it. He had fetishes about everything. He was sleeping naked with the women just to say that, you know. If you repress your erotic side, it will emerge somewhere. Yoga knows not to repress it. Yoga says give it full play. That is the entire side of creativity. Is there a cross and yoga said give it full play? Yeah. I can show you hundreds of No, no. Is there a cross? Uh, give it full 
play a part. Naturally, nobody is advocating promiscuity. Nobody is advocating promiscuity, which is not the same as morality and not the same as fidelity and all that. Nobody is advocating promiscuity. Brahmacharya basically means sexual restraint. Brahmacharya basically means understanding that the sexual impulse, the erotic impulse is a hugely powerful shakti and we don't play the fool with it. We respect it. We work with it. It can transform you if you know what you are doing. I should really start speaking about these things. It's just that, you know, immediately people recoil. He's a yogi. He's talking about sex. Ooh. You know, yogis are not supposed to talk about sex and about money. Actually, only yogi should talk. Only people of higher consciousness should talk about these two things. Others, it is in the hands of the corrupt and the pervert. Yeah? The corrupt people talk about money and the perverted people talk about sexuality. <laughs> people of normal, healthy consciousness are not supposed to talk about that. It's the complete derailment of good sense. The complete derailment of good sense. And this Zabardasti ka celibacy, so you can see one spirit, scandal after the other keeps erupting in some spiritual community. This teacher was caught with some disciple. <laughs> because no yogi is going to give up on what he gets from the sexual act. He knows. He knows how much power is released into his sadhana and into his life with the sexuality. So what do they do since the donations will dry up, since there will be so many accusations of being perverse, they all hide it. Unless you are naturally celibate, that is a different matter. About 4%, 5% of the population are naturally celibate, usually more women than men. The rest of them, the rest of them have to, the rest of them have to pretend. And I am saying time to stop this, time to stop this whole thing because you know, scandal after scandal, the last 30 years nearly anybody prominent, I mean to me it was like this is it, now we need to when that, you know that uh, Kriyananda, that old Gura fellow who used to come on TV, yes, Paramahansa Yogananda, even he was outed as, <laughs> even he was outed as having a relationship once and when there was a little political fight they brought it up. So I'm like, they all do it. Okay, maybe not Yogananda, he also seems to be one of those natural. They all do it, so it's time to stop this hypocrisy, it's time to stop this veil and you know, just, just be open. That way, Vimalananda and all much better, you know, because they were Grihast yogis and they are much better. And I'm very, very glad today that Grihast yogis are now becoming gurus, they are now becoming teachers, because this entire crippling, this entire idiotic, aspect of sexuality is actually stopping it's, it's a, it's a So that's uh, that's yama. That's basically the five samajik yama that is it. Then your individual yama is your problem. Your guru, god, nobody can help you. You have to discover them on your own. <laughs> you can ask your guru, but they are yours. Your individual yamas are your, your own. Your individual enclosure. Your individual field of possibility. You see the word Kshetram. You know, because of Kurukshetra, we mistake it as field, but it's not field, it's a zone you create so that you transform yourself. Which is why in Malayalam the temple is known as Kshetra. It is a zone of possibility, it is a zone of transformation. So your Yama creates a Kshetram for you. And then you do your sadhana, you live your life in a kshetra. Because your body is actually the kshetra. Your body is the greatest temple there ever is. Greater than Kailasa, greater than Arnachinam, greater than any temple that can ever be made. Your own physical body. Yama is the first step or the first requirement to creating that kshetra. That zone of possibility, that zone of transformation. So, as I say, it is not a rung on a ladder that you can forget about always going to be there. Yes? Meditation? Sarvanshya.